and welcome to the Glacially Musical Podcast. It is beer, metal, swearing. It is me, Nick Cameron of Glacial Musical, joined by Keefe, nickname Chakas, the guy who does the, that always happens. How are we doing today? I what? didn't prepare. What the heck? I didn't prepare. Nickname Chakas. <laughs> I am sorry. is the nickname, so it's fine. I know. I I I I, I had a fucktoberfest of a day, but unfortunately it's November. So That's uh true. just you know what? Because it's that kind of day. Beer check. My first beer is a secret beer hug by Goose Island Brewing, a 6.5% ABV in my four hands. Uh, pint glass, which I got for free at Steve's Hot Dogs. Look at the pour. Look at the pour. Look so at I have an interesting thing to tell you about that pour. That pour is the reason why you get burpees every week. Why? I've been watching a lot of YouTubes and TikToks from bartenders. Uh-huh. And that's the wrong pour. What? That's the wrong pour to get. That's the pour to get no head. So you can drink it right away. It looks good. And I'm gonna let you drink your beer and shut up. But like, that's the wrong, the pour to get the, so like it's science. If you pour the beer straight in and you get a dumb foamy head, all the gases expel in the air instead of in your belly. That's why you. Everyone is watching me right now. Make this face. Nick is making for those on the podcast. Nick is making a face at me. I will share the video with you. Here's what I can tell you um, for certain. I was in Birmingham, Alabama on a business trip. And the guy who was taking all of us out, it was one dude from Birmingham and one dude from Pennsylvania, one dude from Tampa and me in St. Louis. All of a sudden, the dude who's hosting, because that's how that company worked. He goes, oh, boys, I got to go finish up. And I literally chugged a 8% double IPA. Uh, I could not burp that shit out for the rest of the night. Not in the glass, just straight out of the can because it was Birmingham. Love you, Birmingham. Anyway, so before Keefe Beer Checks, thank you very much for checking out the Glacially Musical podcast and YouTube review. Live knew nothing because this is YouTube and nobody wants to see me naked, not even my wife. Uh, She tolerates me naked. Anyway, so... If you are here because of the Iowa gentleman, please, thank you. Uh, Go ahead and give us a like. Go ahead and leave a comment saying thank you for doing this, and we'll explain more as we get along. But here is how this goes. Intro, beer check, vinyl check, shirt check, news, meet. We are now still halfway through the beer check. So, Keefe? We are. I am. So I'm beer checking in honor, uh, partially of a news item, in honor of this weekend's Dios de los Deftones Festival in San Diego. I have what I have already had, a Deftones Phantom Bride IPA. Uh, This is really awesome. I love these beers. And I'm going to pop my pop. Little one. And I'm going to try the YouTube pour. Let's see if I fuck this up. Straight in. That's what they said to do. That is shit. Is there any beer in there? There's beer. I'm, t- I'm going to show you the thing and your jaw's going to hit the floor. When you pour like this, yes, it doesn't look pleasing because we're all trained. To that see is, that like but this. you know what? That is dissipating on it the d- plate. It will dissipate. I don't need to sip this right away. Literally pour it straight in. Get the gases out into the atmosphere and not into your body. When you pour with the small head, all the, all the gases are in the beer. You drink the beer aggressively and then you have the burpees and you have all the gas in your body. And it, and even it was alluded to that it even prevents you from tasting the beer correctly. So we want to taste the beer. I'm going to try this, even though I know the peer, the poor looks abysmal by poor standards. It's a, all right, poor you know pour. what? I will, I will, I will give that a go. What's your uh, vinyl check, sir? <clears throat> I'm going to whip through the vinyl check. First, I'm going to talk about how I'm such a sellout. Uh, I have a rule in my life where I don't go to Walmart. I don't spend money at Walmart. I do nothing for Walmart. Here is my copy of the Red Hot Chili Peppers Blood Sugar Sex Magic Walmart Edition. Because you know what? Uh, apparently, all it takes is a $25 version on red vinyl. And I will drop my drawers and piss on my values 
Uh, I'm going to follow that up with something that is probably best used for the Department of Mental Antiquities in two years. KK's Priest. I am not a giant fan of the Judas Priest. They're okay. Don't, um, you know, Judas Priest, Motorhead, you know, frankly, I'm a casual fan. It, it is what it is. And, but Duncan and I did an, ep- did an episode on Jugulator, which was a Blaze ba- Blaze Bailey, a Tim Ripper Owens record. And you know what? I really dug that. And I really dug Ripper's voice. I thought that he was really good at impersonating Rob and putting his own spin on the Rob. So made me want to hear KK's Priest. And it, uh, I, I will agree it's lacking in songs, but it makes up for it in enthusiasm. I am, yeah, I don't know how to take that middling priest and motorhead talk, but uh, just, I'm just a big I ripper. Am, I'm a big ripper fan. He's certainly, I would say, imitating is a little strong. Yes, he's covers Rob very well on the Rob originals. I think both those records are pretty underrated. The next one's not as good as that one. You have the good one. KK's Priest, also good. Judas Priest getting into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame this weekend along, uh, you know, um, KK will be there. It's going to be awkward, as well as Les Banks, who's in KK's band and not in Priest for like 31 years, 32 agreed, years. Agreed, agreed. We did and hit this last week, though. We did, but anyway. Ripper should Ripper should be getting in. It's a shit show what they've done now. You know, if for me, it, I'm going to take eight seconds. When it comes to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, it is like sports championship teams. Everybody gets a ring. Period. Everyone or no one. Uh, well, no. I, I don't know. Um, more, more to discuss next week. But anyway. Fair. My vinyl check, because I'm nothing if not on brand. First of all, pro- I love your vinyls and, re- you know, that Chili Peppers record's untouchable. My favorite Chili Peppers record. Yeah, I think everyone's their, favorite. Their best record. Yeah. Uh, on brand for this episode of the podcast and this series, the debut album by Slipknot. Nice. On is vinyl. This is yellow pressing? This is the brand new yellow, pre- recent yellow pressing. Man, I um, wonder why I know that. I wonder why you know that. You might have one. Nope. Um, but anywho, so Not yeah, today. there's it comes with this awesome cardboard sleeve, no mylar, so we need to normalize the mylar. Very cool photos. The chili the peppers actually packaging. came with the mylar. I was gonna ask you L- lyrics in case you're mm-hmm. a fan of what does Corey Taylor think and all his lyrics. Um, this is the the vinyl is the original album version there we'll get into it when we discuss the album how many versions of this album there are so it came in the cardboard sleeve within the jackets and the yellow slipknot with the very cool slipknot logo it looks like uh it looks like like it's the color of scrambled eggs it kind of looks like pee to me um fair and then my other vinyl, also on brand for this series, the brand new Slipknot album, Unopened with the Error. This is Ooh. the end so far. Hold on um, to that and sell it later. Well, right now, it's going for upwards of $400 Holy on the shit. web. I thought about selling it right away because I could use the money and buy other things. $400. So it was supposed to be called The End for Now. And then they changed their mind at the last second, but the jacket was already being printed. So, so literally, this is unopened with the sticker over it. I love the record, so I kind of want to keep it. It's also, like, like Pink Floyd's first rendition of The Wall that has, right. uh, what do we do now in right. the lyrics? I, wanted, I, I want this record, so I really kind of don't want to sell it, but I also am very tempted to sell it. Um, uh, if, if it were me, this is just me, because that change means nothing. It's It's just... I would sell it and and and, and buy a regular get another one for thirty yeah. bucks. By the so way, here's my, here's my beer now. A few minutes later, looks with spectacular. All the foam out, and I'm gonna take a sip. I already know it tastes great. I love this beer. It's my favorite. Uh, Deftones has four or five beers. This is the one I like the most. Fair enough. Uh, mm-hmm. Now, shirt check. I am wearing the shirt I should have worn one of the weeks during Pink Floyd. My Pink Floyd Animals T-shirt. It wasn't clean, and you know we moved. I've whinged on about my move 
for hours and I've still got 20 hours of whinging to go and I'm sorry. However, I have not gotten myself into a good like laundry rhythm here. It just hasn't, it just hasn't happened. So laundry oh, my rhythm. pants smell bad. But that's is that, the point. Is that like God rhythm by Jesus Peace? Um no, it's, it's Get Rhythm by John. Oh no, Cash. uh Wisdom and Chains. Sorry, God Rhythm is the album by Wisdom and Chains, the hardcore mm. man. Um, I don't know, that's a cool shirt. I had one once. And uh this shirt that I'm wearing is from the weed and beer themed band from Oakland, Connoisseur on Tank Crimes Records. This is a shirt from the Art of Skinner and uh, can't, comes with the appropriate Skinner graphics. Uh, kind of has like an evil clown on the bong here. I don't like clowns. I don't know if we've discussed, it's not quite a phobia, but I just have a distaste. <laughs> Creepy clowns fuck me up in a like nightmare scenario, mental, mental way. And just, not let, me just, let me just say, don't watch Clown NATO. Okay, yeah, you, we discussed this. I, the shirt did also come with a connoisseur sticker and a Skinner sticker. So that's really I, cool. I have something by them somewhere. Yeah, Skinner, he, you, you might know him. He did the artwork for some Mastodon album. No, uh, Coinosaur. I have something. Oh, Coinosaur. Yeah, they're really good. I think they have a split EP with Trappist, who is a band of brewers who make metal songs about beers. So we should be probably reviewing these guys. I'm interested. I, I have immediate interest in this. It's like band. very sludgy, doom, primitive man type stuff. However, I don't like Trappist beers. But you know what? We'll that's a bridge we'll cross when we come to it maybe they'll send us a six pack all right then but uh let's if you don't mind trying to stay on point yeah because we love to talk and i love to hear my own voice and i love to hear your voice so i hate oh, cutting you off you but silly let's 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 focus up uh news of the day i have one thing i want to discuss ace fraley may or may not have been banned from appearing at the chiller convention uh, a someone who claims to have worked in security talked about how terrible Ace was doing all the things Ace does, being hours late, taking breaks, locking himself out of the room, yada, 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 claiming he was using chiller time to sign for private dealers, thereby kicking the, the band out, kicking the fans out, this and that, basically being a horrible chump. Now, here's where I want to defend Ace Fraley and tell you how, oh my God, Ace loves his fans. That's why he tours in these shitty clubs at age 78 or nine or 67, I, whatever, how old he is, I don't care. And no, he does that because he gets, needs to get paid. So he also raised the prices. It was $50 for his signature, $20 for planets, $30 to have your name put on it as well. I mean, crazy, crazy pricing, and frankly, everything I heard it sounded exactly like Ace Fraley. However, his manager, John Ostrovsky, has now taken to Facebook to rebut. And let me just sum up the rebuttal as such. Ace Fraley is a saint among human beings, practically godlike, worked hard to stop COVID, saw a small child who was a fan and loved him to death and gave him time and worked with the fire marshals and screamed at the convention, no, I will not stop now. I will wait until all fans are signed. So the question becomes, do you believe the dude who said Ace Fraley acted like Ace Fraley? Or do you believe the dude who said Ace Fraley acted like a god among men? The truth is probably somewhere in the middle. I don't uh, know. I think the truth is in that first one, but that's I, just me. I think I'm Facebook friends with Ace's manager. So we're not friendly. We're not mm -hmm. friends. We're acquaintances. We emailed each other at times. Uh, he goes by John Astronomy, and you may know him from the former podcast Talking Metal and the TV show Talking Metal on Fuse. That's Ace's manager. Uh, you can see him in the Talking Metal on Fuse opening credits dressed as Ace as a teenager with his 58 yeah. sun, Sunburst Les Paul. He is now managing Ace's career, uh, for better or worse. I think it's probably a little bit of both. I think, you know, listen, the getting is good right now. Kisses on the farewell tour. This stuff will never be more valuable than now because there has never been deprivation is not a strategy that uh, Gene and Paul believe in. There has never been a time where Kiss stuff has not been readily available unless we discontinued it already. That's my Gene impression. And so, like, 
you know, now is the good time to get the most money possible for all these things. No, both, I, I, both, I completely agree. You know, all the chumps that the chumps are actually Vinny Vincent's fans who paid like a lot of money to barely hear him play. Uh, Peter, you know, I love and I will never say a cross thing about, although I know he has been not, you know, has been irascible at times. Hey, be kind. These, these guys are rock stars from the 70s and rock music in the 70s was a very different thing than it is now. And they're they're doing their best to, uh, you know, make their way in the world today. It, and making your way in the world today takes everything you got. Taking a break from all your worries, man, it, it sure would help a lot. Wouldn't you and, like to get away? And that's why Ace took a break an hour into his signing for two hours. But that's besides the point. That's brutal. I have worked at some conventions as a guest, uh, as an attendee and a panelist. And these things need to run like clockwork or they run off the rails like a train badly. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice quote there of the Cheers theme song for those who did not get up. I used to do musical theater as a teenager. I went to the, as you know, the high school performing arts, blah, blah, blah. And Cheers theme song was one of my audition songs for things to give people a taste of my range. Not the best idea I ever <laughs> had, but like it was. Did you, do, did you do all three verses? I did all three verses and I nice. acted out the lyrics. It was oh. embarrassing. Just, oh my lord okay you know what this conversation is now over yes you got any news you want to talk about um you know priest in the hall of fame uh i know lamb you're of really god, excited about that lamb of god but i am really first of all i am really excited about this because as much as i love acdc and other and yes they are not metal no they're not metallica black sabbath and now judas priest will be the uh, three bands that are metal in the hall three. of fame I'll take it. Three. I'll take three. Maiden definitely should be next, and it's a crim- crime that they're not in. Already, well, it's, but... it's one of the things we talked about last week with Emily, Emily Burton of Fireball Ministry. No matter how big a metal band is, 99 times out of 100, they are still the tiniest little fish. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean yes and no. Pond. It's weird because, oh, here's the thing. So there was a report this week that was widely reported in places. Just want to talk about streaming for a second. Nick is not a fan of streaming. I'm a fan of streaming's utility. I need streaming to do what I do as a journalist for no, GhostCodeMag.com. Nick is streaming in terms of just a listening experience and just in terms of like, you know, it doesn't pay. Even the best case scenarios, it doesn't pay. So, you know, streaming, here's a fun thing. Spotify had their earnings call, which kind of, you know, like, uh, mm. business. What are you doing, Keith? You talking about business hear me out spotify had their business call in which two of their senior executives acknowledged the vast majority slipknot is now uh, sorry slipknot. oh i spotify know this story <laughs> has now eclipsed a hundred thousand songs being uploaded a day so the fact that it's kind of a utilitarian platform for all seems very marxist to me in a good way but like on the other hand enraging definitely 40 percent of our listeners like there are No way anyone is hearing all these songs. The vast majority of songs uploaded to to Spotify are never heard by anyone. They're just out there in space. People are uploading their podcasts and no one is listening. If you're listening to this on a podcast, thank you so much. Because apparently the vast majority, we're all chasing this Spotify high and this hope that one, you know, a lot of bands are hoping to get on one playlist that it blows up their whole career it's really not the case because most people are not, most people are hearing a small selection of fi- of songs. At the same time, concurrent to this data, once again, for the umpteenth year in a row, heavy metal, extreme metal, and all subgenres of metal have the most loyal listenership who listen to the same shit over and over. New bands come into the genre and we glom onto them and cling to them. Like no other fans, not country, not these huge pop stars with hundreds of billions of streams. Metal and rock fans are driving the loyal the loyalty of the listenership of all of streaming. That let your mind work on that for a second. Thoughts, Nicholas. If I may. Oh shoot, you said you okay. I don't have to say that. Uh, so sorry. Real quick, one a hundred thousand songs per day. That is sixty thousand records per week. I didn't continue the math, but there are only, assume, 30 records worth of time in a day. That is 210 records a week if you never slept and just drank coffee 
and listen to, to music. As for uh, metal and hard rock fans, one of the things I routinely tell my kid who has so many phases is, look, music I listened to when I was your age is on the goddamn shelf. M music I listened to when I was younger than you is still here. I got into Iron Maiden at age seven. Seven. I am 46 for now. It's ending soon. But 40 years, basically, of listening to Iron Goddamn Maiden. I got into Metallica in the late 80s, still listening to Metallica. When I think to myself, oh, am I going to buy, am I going to pre-order such and such band's new record? That's rare for me. You know, it's it once, maybe, maybe that's just in our DNA. Maybe that is just what makes us who we are in terms of hard rock and metal fans. We go back to the beginning. If it's like it's like anime fans, right? If you get into an anime, you end up spending five thousand dollars on that anime. Maybe that's just what we do. We're just we're just American anime otaku metal dudes. Any other news for us this week? Not really. I just wanted to share those things. I mean, there's a Lamb of God boat cruise. Um, there's a lot of fun things already on the band. Uh, albums are starting to get announced for 2023 that haven't already been. So I think there's a lot of fun, fun things on the horizon for music fans, heavy music fans. Last thing, I, I'm going to say two more things and then we can, then we can begin the process. First of all, uh, as Keithy likes to say, I am famous for stating that until 1985, records were the only home media. There was nothing else. You records or television or radio. You could not buy a movie. You could not buy a show. You could not buy a video game. The only thing you could do at home. And the absolute proof I saw of this, I'm at the antique mall the other day because it, it's close to work. And you know what? Sometimes I don't want to be at work on my lunch break. So I go down there and I found a Hardy Boys record. Not a book on vinyl. This was a fictional record by the Hardy Boys called Here Comes the Hardy Boys. That's where vinyl and music was at one point in time, is it was the abject emperor of media. And, you know, when people talk about this killed it, that killed it, it's not Napster, it's not movies, it's it's competition. You know, if you have $50 to spend each paycheck on whatever you want, well, maybe this week you buy a video game, maybe next week you buy a record. And the week after that, you take your girl out for a couple of drinks and a movie. I mean, you know, just keep that in mind. And the last thing I will say, and I will let Keepy take this away, is I am not a fan of Slipknot walking into this. I saw a Slipknot in 1997 or 98. I know Keefe has corrected me on the actual date when it was, because I always forget. Either way, it was when they were playing the second stage at Ozfest before any main stage acts even hit, even started. So they're they're playing very early. It's the height of the Kiss reunion tours, and I see these guys in masks, and I think you guys are fucking stupid. And I turned off at that moment. I completely turned off. And the, apart from just, you know, straight up selling out for clicks, slips for clicks, I actually did want to listen to Slipknot. I wanted to take out the visuals. I am a Kiss fan who loves the music of Kiss more than the visuals of Kiss. I don't need Ace Fraley wearing silver makeup. I don't need Gene Simmons breathing fire to enjoy Firehouse. They're good songs. Secretly Cruel, however, is not a good song. In fact, most of Gene's songs are bad. But, but so I am going to lean on the Keefe this, this, this series because I need help. I, I'm not familiar when, oh, there's the burpee. Holy shit. Anyway, callback. So when, you know, Keefe talks about frequently that Slipknot is one of the biggest metal bands in the world, I closed myself off decades ago from them. So this is a revelatory series for me. I have a similar anecdote. I was not an original Slipknot fan. 
And I can either tell that anecdote now or I can tell it another time in the series. Let's go I another think. time. Well, okay. I, I gave my, you can hit yours next week. Okay. I, I, it's worth saving for next week. That's fine. Okay, um, cool. It's not integral to the story. So we chose Slipknot. I chose Slipknot. It was my turn. And I chose Slipknot. I have a new album out. They, Nick acquiesced. I appreciate it. They, Nick will pick the next one. Um, they are in, indelibly the second most important band in metal right now. If they be more important than Metallica, at least as important or more. They move the needle for everyone else. They have their own culture and metal lifestyle website called Knotfest, which was a genius move. They have a series of festivals called Knotfest now all over the world. They're the juggalos of metal. They well, that's in a way, yes, and that's. I don't. I don't mean thing. that negatively. Yeah. To be clear, I. I just mean the, the ICP guys are brilliant marketing geniuses. Correct. They created a whole culture around their weirdo rap metal, rap rock stuff, and whatever the uh, hell it is. Yeah, they're retiring soon, but the culture is going to live on. Like, uh, you know, whatever the gathering of the juggalos, their whole yeah, thing I mean, is going to live forever. You know, juggalos, the bohabs, and the the, mm-hmm. the slipknot whatevers. Maggots. Maggots? Is that, okay, I don't know. They, they have all created a culture and a, an identity. You know, they talk about the Kiss Army. They talk about, you know, Dave Mustaine calls his fans the Drugs. Drugs. Drugies. Which, I mean, r- frankly, that's fucking lazy as shit, Dave. That we've all seen the movie. He loves that movie, though. We all um, love that movie. I don't, I don't, I've never heard a Megadeth fan refer to themselves as a Drug or a Drugie. Maybe that's Um, what he calls them. I don't know. But uh, KISS fans like to say they've been in the KISS Army since blank. You've heard me use that expression, KISS Army, since 77. I had the card at one point. I may still have it here somewhere um, in the storage. But anyway. But these three bands have made an actual culture around their fans. Yeah, yeah. It's really smart. It's really smart. Especially in this day and age where everything is disposable. Correct. How they did it is fascinating. And we're not going to totally delve into all of that. But I just thought Slipknot's inherently interesting. We're going to cover their first four albums. It's about 11 years. At the very end, we might skate through that last 12, 13 years just in like a minute or two. But I just think it's very inherently interesting how Slipknot came from this underground place to become this enormous, enormous everything they do. They've done not- So even Metallica has failures, right? Orion Fest was a financial failure, even though I think on paper it was awesome uh through the never is a complete failure great um, soundtrack though i'm just gonna say many that. of their fans hate some kind of monster it, they consider it a triumph it's i hate derided, it <laughs> derided by all their fans i've never watched all of it because don't. i don't want to see dave mustaine cry that's where i draw the line mm. um they all cry yeah well, except um, newstead jason's peaced out he was smart he knew that shit was bullshit but um yeah how did they do it so that's what I think that to me, it's a more always almost as equally interesting to the music is how did they do this? How did they do this? They're not from New York or LA. They're from Iowa. And granted, they don't live there mostly anymore, most of them. But like, it's just yeah, mind still, blowing. That's it's where just, they were from. It's not even Chicago. It's Iowa, dude. If you're not American, Iowa is like, you know, I don't know. It is the most the north of England. It is the most backwater place in America. It's not the smallest place, but if you're from Montana, you can be like, fuck you. I'm from Montana. Right. If you're from Iowa, you're like, I'm from I Iowa. still feel like the Southeast is more backwater than the Midwest, but you're the Midwestern expert here and I am not. Look, um, discuss. I have, I live in, you know, St. Louis, Missouri. I abut Iowa. I am going to Iowa this in December to watch a hockey game because why the fuck else would you go there except to get away from iowa is the place where you go to get away from you only go there to leave you go there on your way to north dakota you go there on your way to minnesota i will i'll have the kid it's fine okay and you know it's that is i mean you once you cross into iowa you cross into nothing it's, you know, that is the corn. It is the children of the corn. The fact that anyone from Iowa made it and they didn't make it by leaving Iowa. They made it out of Iowa. You know, Tom Arnold makes the joke about being from Iowa. Oh, it's cold. 
but he went to California to make it. These fuckers get huge from Iowa. That, that I, I, sorry, I, 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 it's astounding, and I appreciate you going on a little bit. I will. Not I'm take, sputtering, and I'm done. No, you're really good. That's great. That's a great setup. So, just really quick, what like what the Midwest does have historically in America is great death metal. And I know that Slipknot is not a traditionally thought of as a death metal band, but actually, in actuality, their roots are strong with the death metal underground of the Midwest. And going way back to the, you know, going back to the um, early 90s, uh, there was a promoter in the Midwest named Jack Koshik. And he had the Milwaukee Metal Meltdown or Milwaukee Metal Fest, right? Oh, God, um, I remember hearing about that back in the 90s. Yeah, yeah. It, it never like, went, unfortunately. Yeah, I never went, but it was like the dream. I My first successful band played the New Jersey version of a Jack Koshik festival. That was I had friends that played Milwaukee Metal Fest. Yeah, so did I. And like all your favorite bands, the lineups for these things were unbelievable. Jamie Josta has bought the brand. I think we discussed this a while back. He has bought the brand and he's resuscitating it in 2023. So actually, probably an announcement for this is imminent. Very um, cool. And he's a huge death metal fan. I know people are like, just the hate breed. But like he is a huge death metal fan. And he, I, I assure you, he's going to do justice. Um, so Slipknot really has its roots in the underground metal scene of the whole Midwest. And there's a series of bands. And I'm going to rattle off some of these names. You can go do the homework. I think after our interview series with Emily Burton of Fire Ministry, we're, I'm going to be a little more careful about my sources and sourcing information. Ooh. But uh, Yeah, course, we got served. We got served, and some of it, I mean, you know, unfortunately, if the information is not out there, as Prince used to say, if you're not on top of the media, the media is going to be on top of you. So you have to control we, your own narrative. We did our best. We did our best. And some of this stuff was a stretch, and I apologize for reaching. So okay. I'm going to try to do this a little more cautiously and purposefully. Um, but the Midwestern death metal scene, especially Iowa, the local Des Moines, Iowa scene was very fertile, had a lot of bands, had a lot of people sharing members and pillaging and purging all the time. But some of these early bands, the original, you know, Slipknot having so many people, nine people ultimately in the band, it was by, it wasn't by, you know, it was an accident that became kind of by design ultimately. But really started with M. Sean Crahan, who was a drummer in uh, a couple of bands, and also Paul Gray, rest in peace, the bassist, as well as Jody, Joey Jordison, also just passed away, uh, the drummer. And so these guys are really the guys who formed what became Slipknot. But there's other people who kind of come in at different parts, and some leave, and their leaving reshapes the band and based on who comes in after. So there's a series of bands that all these guys kind of shared. Body Pit, Modifidius, great name. On a Pale Horse, it's probably an On a Pale Horse in every city. Uh, Meld, Pale Ones, which was kind of a descendant of On a Pale Horse. Stone Sour, you have heard of, which has, you know. Yes. Re oh, yeah. Oh, God, yeah. Stuff. So that's one of those bands from the early to mid 90s. This is like 91, 92. All these guys know each other. They all went to high schools or rival high schools. Um, later Slipknot members, such as uh, Mick Thompson and Jim Root played in other bands. Um, and so there's a there's a Midwestern death metal band from uh minnesota called anal blast and they sometimes you know they were a fixture of the scene uh don decker also passed away rest in peace and i think he passed during the covid years okay real, hang on let's stop naming our bands anal anything it was let, the 90s and the oh, early gonna, this um, is the death metal grindcore they're a grindcore band that should tell you what you need to know anal, okay fair okay i i withdraw uh yeah so just Anywho, Anal Blast is a very regionally popular band. They play all the gruesome death metal fa fa festivals, similar to how Hatebreed became the local band that opened for the national bands. Anal Blast would open for Carcass and Napalm Death and play Milwaukee, Milwaukee Metal Fest. And so Don Decker was the only real regular member of that band. And he was a booker in Minnesota and Wisconsin and Chicago, and he was infamous. 
Uh, by the way, just like you think that Anal Blast is a terrible name, they're like horribly misogynist and gross like porno grind now. Uh, oh, okay. Not a genre I favor. But the reason keep this, walking. <laughs> this reason this band is important is at one point in 1994, this band featured Joey Jordison, Paul Gray, and Mick Thompson in their live band. Mm-hmm. So that's three of the future, fa- you know, like two that's, founding members and an integral person. In that's Slippery. the core. Just by accident, they played, you know, a year of tours together. So those guys built a chemistry. Paul and Joey had a chemistry. Sean decides to form the band with Paul, decides that he's like, oh, he saw Joey. And he's like, this guy is one of the most incredible drummers I've ever seen. And I'm pretty mediocre. I can go over to like do percussion and build this. Per- so like Slipknot was really built on this idea of, Percu- a percussionist heavy band with multiple percussionists and Man, the metal I wonder band. if I've ever heard of an extreme metal band based on percussion. We're going to get there. We will. We're, g- we're going to get there. So Anal Blast sows the seeds of some of those guys having a chemistry. Concurrently, Clown forms the band with Paul and they recruit Joey. So now you have the three guys that really form the band. And Joey, one of the first songs they write is called Slipknot. And Joey is the person who's like, we should just call the band Slipknot. That's perfect. Wait, did they do uh, Slipknot, Slipknot, Slipknot? Like Tony, Tony, Tony? No, like Black Sabbath from Black Sabbath by Black Sabbath. Yeah, they kind they kind of did. Uh, the, okay. the song Slipknot is on an early demo, never to be, you know. Uh, okay, repeated. so they didn't do the triple. Okay. They didn't do the triple in the in the now era, but eventually yeah, they did. Um, so Clown goes over to percussion. Joey is on drums. Paul is on bass. And they have a series of guys. They have a singer named and- Anders Colsafini, who was in the band for quite a long time, most of the next five years. Uh, they also have a guitar player, Donnie Steele, who is integral to the early sound of the band being as metal and technical as it is, because he's an incredible guitar player. And another guy comes in later, Josh Brainerd, who you may have heard of also. Uh, Josh also was in some of these other bands. And so... The band starts doing demos and they uh, they start to kind of grow locally. And the, the image came later. They had Slipknot. It was going to be like murder lyrics and serial killers and this heavy percussive, percussive thing that straddled like sort of 90s metal and death metal. What's the in-between? At the same time, you have Korn and Deftones and Coal Chamber and the explosion of new metal. Yeah, but I mean, if you think about Cold Chamber and Corn, whereas later they became new metal, in their in their beginning stages, they were not. Well, Corn wasn't. I gotta disagree. Uh, Corn and Cold Chamber and early Deftones invented the template of new metal strictly by what how they made music. They turned down the A. They played these seven string guitars. They played these bar chord riffs. These very mm. simple riffs. Slipknot was already a little more musically uh, mature even though they were unknown because they had these guys who played in technical, brutal grindcore death metal bands. They had one of the greatest drummers to ever live, Joey Jordison. They had a creative artistic visionary like clown who thought like in 3d where everybody else is seeing like a dog in black and white clown right. sees in, in like an architecture. He sees an AutoCAD. If you understand my meaning in the Ooh, AutoCAD, no, there we go. Pulling, pulling out references. So Slipknot goes through some changes. They create a demo and they draw the attention of Ross Robinson who had produced corn and had actually made his, really made his name by producing the demo that got Fear Factory signed to Roadrunner, even though that album didn't come out for a long time because they didn't like working with him. But Ross, who invented the new metal production style, the and you know enabled the production to translate these tuned down to A when almost no bands did that. And that was, drum sound, that the David Silveria drum sound, right? That popped off drums. Yeah, and then Ross, and, you know, he becomes kind of an iconic producer. Or he produces a bunch of in, 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 hey, in, every genre spice. of metal takes right. It it takes a sound. I mean, we talked about death metal, Mora Sound Studios. But if you talk to death metal fans, they never talk about Slipknot. Even now, they will not recognize Slipknot as a great yeah, death metal. I mean, band. I, but I we're going to get into why they are in a, in a little bit. Probably next episode, really, when they really full fledged become a death metal band, more death metal than anything. Death metal with some commercial hooks and some new metal hooks but basically in an essence a very heavy band a band heavier than most of the most extreme bands you would cite yeah normally. and if i could you know when i first saw them again you know like i said it was 
Ozfest early, early years, you know, and the things that turned me off were the masks, the anonymity thing, which is completely unironically stupid because I loved Kiss. I still love, I loved and still love Kiss, but seeing all of those drums and I, I don't know if I mentioned it on, on this podcast, but I went through maybe a 20 year period where I was completely closed off to new music, completely closed off. If I found one new band a year, I'm like, oh yeah, I found a band. Unfortunately, lots of those were butt rock because it was the 90s and the early aughts. But hearing, excuse me, listening to um, Sepultura, which I believe we are headed towards, Sepultura Rock and Rio with uh, the, the Bronx Tambors, I can't pronounce it, uh, that really the fact that I got into that much later except with it being Sepultura it was easier for me to accept that kind of hyper percussion which is what Slipknot is and has always been that hyper percussion through Sepultura listening to Territory listening to all the songs on that live record that I loved already made it easier for me to listen to this well, allow me to tell you you're right about that, because I'm going to say probably an unchecked reference is Sepultura, especially Chaos AD, especially Roots. Amazing but, record, by the way. Chaos, Chaos AD is one of the best of the 90s. And especially the song Kiowas, which has not that a one. gang of percussion. Yes, absolutely. It's the I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm not a big fan of that one. But, the, the but percussion... that's the song that directly influences the, the, the multiple percussionists. They're literally all playing toms or gasoline know, cans or whatever i know i know i know, I know. you can it's, it's me. basically you can disagree heavy... but like if no you're there is my no, point there not... is no disagreement i just don't like it it's heavy okay. metal stomp whatever i mean like they were leaning into their culture i think that's completely unfair. completely uh, i think stomp is is pop culture heavy metal roots anyway fair um anywho i'm gonna now speed through the next little section of this at the same time, Slipknot is forming and not yet formed its sound and is slowly developing this personas of clown masks and things. There's a band out of Cleveland formed in 1993, right about the same time as Slipknot or right before them, before Slipknot really takes their name and shape. There's a band called Mushroom Head you might have heard of. Uh, I saw them on us. Mushroom Head set out to be new metal, not as heavy as Slipknot, to be real. And honestly has never really had a song as good as the best songs of Slipknot. They are a great band on their own. They have some terrific records. They are still putting out records 30 years later, almost. And But they're just not quite as good as Slipknot. However, they were already up and running and touring the whole Midwest and opening for national bands like Slayer by 95, 96. This is three years, four years before Slipknot is out. Right? Slipknot doesn't come out till 99, the way we know them now. Correct. On Roadrunner. So... Mushroom Head is already gaining a name. And so when Slipknot comes along, people are like, who are these Mushroom Head ripoff guys? Fuck these guys outside of Iowa and outside of Des Moines. But in the rest of the Midwest, Cleveland, Illinois, your city. Cleveland rocks, by the way. Cleveland. Hello, Cleveland. People were like shitting on them before they were even known. But anyway, their demo with Ross attracts them. Ross is like, listen, I'm going to put out like my own. I got some clout now because of Corn and, and Sepultura. This is 90. 95, they put out uh, their very first demo official record, Mate, Feed, Kill, Repeat, which is going for thousands of dollars still if you can get an original CD on eBay. Whew. It's I've listened, I listened to it in the preparation for this. It's not where I didn't have you listen to it because it's it's good. It's not great. You see where the step, the building blocks of the band are. And it's probably a lot like when we did Quiet Riot. We started not quite there in yet. Japan. Yeah, not even not that far. It's a little better. It's better than Japan Quiet Riot, but it's not 1999 Slipknot yet either. And the reason yeah. is they're missing a couple of crucial pieces. And so no, I get it. They put they put that they put their demo out. They go work with Ross. They make this first debut album, uh, Mate Mate Feed Kill Repeat. And Ross is like, listen, I have some clout now. He does a Roots record, blows up. He's rich. He's like, I'm gonna put out my own label, and I want to sign you guys to my label. That ends up interesting Roadrunner, who had already worked with Ross on a bunch of stuff, not Corn, but, you know, Sepultura. At a certain point, because of his work with Corn, 
every Roadrunner band, including Sepultura, all made like, a, again, they were either forced to or instructed to make a new metal influence record. Every band did it. Your favorite bands, Fear Factory, Machine Head, everyone did it except Life of Agony. And then they would sign new bands. Blood, sweat, and tears. They, they Blood, sweat, and gears. They, signed, they signed bands that sounded like new metal bands or they had like a little something industrial or something extra in them that had that kind of feeling. And so... Think of record labels as piranha. A little bit. but When, like, when there's some chum in the water. Yeah. Road, Roadrunner goes, says to Ross, like, no, don't put them out on your record. We want to sign this band and put them out. But Slipknot was a little still kind of forming and coy. So they they play they they play the show and they you know like their the record didn't they didn't really get the feeding frenzy they had hoped for they were like oh they were getting a lot of hype because of Ross and because of the first record but they really didn't have that many they had some offers and it, was, it wasn't competitive so they were like ah you know I don't know what we're, what's the missing ingredient that we're lacking and they they looked at their singer who's a good singer a decent vocalist but like for whatever reason they weren't vibing with him. They might've been moving in a heavier direction and like he wasn't jiving with him. So in a local band called Slipknot, uh, called Stone Sour is a guy named Corey Taylor, a little old guy you might've heard of, right? They okay. recruit him to come in and become the new singer. And Anders is like, well, I can be the co-lead singer and sort of back him up like a rap hype guy and back up and, and I'll move to percussion and Clown and I will be the, the co-percussionist and Corey can come in and sing and he also plays guitar and he writes and he raps. And maybe he's a little more versatile than Anders, which is really what it is. Anders is more like a screamy Jonathan Davis without the melody. And Corey is the full meal deal. He's very talented. So they get Corey in and now the band starts to really coalesce. And they, and they make this final demo that ends up getting them signed to Roadrunner. Ross is looped in to produce the record. They go originally to Indigo Ranch in Malibu, where Ross has now bought a studio to record. He recorded Corn and he recorded Roots, except in the jungle. And some of it was done back in Iowa. During the recording of the record, they record like 90% of the record and the, the guitar, uh, I, I think at one point Donnie Steele leaves because he's like very Christian and he's like, all these serial killer lyrics are hurting me and they're really bothering me and I can't sleep at night and I can't do this music anymore. So Donnie Steele leaves and Josh Brainerd comes in. Josh Brainerd writes most of the debut Slipknot record with Mick and Clown and, you know, Paul and, and really most of the riffs come from Paul, Joey and, and Clown. The majority of the original Slipknot record is really from them. Uh, not counting melodies and and word, lyrics, rhymes and stuff. During the recording, Josh ends up leaving the band. They were already kind of fighting with him in the studio and he's not working out. So at the last second, Jim Root, who had been in some of these other bands with some of these guys, is recruited to come in at the last second. He plays a couple of lead guitars and the Slipknot lineup with, with uh, DJ Craig, uh, Craig on kind of like synthesizers and sound effects and DJ Sid, the scratcher, he had come in, you started to have bands like Head PE had a scratcher and Incubus used to have DJ scratching and Limp Biscuit had a DJ and a scratcher, DJ Lethal. So you're starting to get kind of like at one hand, they have this brutal heaviness, this like chaotic extreme heaviness of the best death metal bands. Chaotic is a great way to describe that. And then they also have this kind of rap metal thing because Corey is a phenomenal rapper. They have DJ scratching. They have like a lot of grooves that sound like corn. They just sound yes. like new metal. Um, yes. Slipknot would not call themselves new metal, but invariably they are the child of death metal and new metal to me. And they so, they are a thing of they 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 are their own like David S. Pumpkins, man. They are their own thing. Right. So they so they they finish the record. They put the record out, Slipknot self-titled debut. There's a lot of hype going on. There was a lot of, there used to be like a lot of industry comps you used to get in the 90s that were like mm -hmm. in the throwout oh, yeah. bins, all these collections and things. And they started to pop up. Some of these first few singles of theirs started to pop up everywhere. And they did this video for the song Spit It Out that is a direct inspiration from um, Stephen King's um, Here's Johnny, what you call it? Uh, Red Shining. Room. The Shining. Literally, it's the Shining Hotel with little Joey, the drummer on a little big wheel and two girls. And it's horrifying and great. Um, you start to see these promo pictures of these guys in jumpsuits and masks. What is this? And Mushroom Head is out already. And here's another band that kind of looks like Mushroom Head. There's also the residents. Like, we're not ignorant to other bands that exist. I know oh, people, there, the there was another band that was like wearing 
red, blue, and silver makeup. Oh, oh shit. Who was that? Not Mudvayne. That was later. No, somebody liked Mudvayne, but yeah, probably the residents is who you're thinking of. They wore big faces with it were painted and very uh, Dali surrealistic. There, there was already a... gore. We haven't even talked yeah. about gore, who you love and I love. There was a lot, but there was a lot of theatrical bands in metal, right. rap metal, and semi rap at this yeah, time. Yeah, there's nine of these guys. It's a gang of dudes all in jumpsuits, like literally mechanic suits or it's flight Leonard suits. Skinner with way more drums. Way more drums, right? Four times the drums. Um, it was just the uh, anniversary of the plane crash, by the way. I'm still tracking oh. down. I'm still trying to interview Artemis Pyle. He's floating out there. I know somebody who manages him. Anyway, Flex. So Slipknot <laughs> puts the record out, and literally my notes say the metal world shits itself because this is before the – really, the internet is in its infantile stages. There's a few websites. Oh, back then, to get metal, you had to, yeah. you had to read like three magazines. You had to read it. three magazines. You had Blabbermouth. Uh, Rip was on the way down, almost over. You still had Guitar World. You still had Revolver as in its heyday. Uh, Cream is Guitar no World more. was still in the heyday at this point. Yeah, Guitar World's huge at this point. Uh, Metal Edge is still a thing. Metal Maniacs is still a thing. Circus Metal Maniacs gone. would not Hit cover Slipknot. Gone. Yeah, I Decibel, mean, who, who was a baby magazine, of, would come along a few years later, would not cover Slipknot for a long time. And they still really don't cover them because I yeah, think it, they it, feel like, yeah, they're just above whatever Slipknot is doing. Well, 90, is 90, 98 is a weird time for media because it's the you're you're losing the traditional print media to the internet but it's not there yet so it's the the traditional print media is lacking power and the internet is lacking power because it has one's losing one's gaining but they're in similar spots so it yeah i mean slipknot it 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 it, it wasn't like corn corn was getting major press on their first record it took time though i'm gonna tell you honestly corn's record came out with very little fanfare but over the next year and a half they got huge Right. And after they sold 800,000 copies of that first album, Guitar World noticed. Yeah. It took Slipknot about two years to get the same bump. Rolling Slipknot Stone notices. It I'm took... reading these magazines at the same time. Yeah. It, right. It took Slipknot about two and a half years to get to where Korn did it in one year, a year right. and a half. But at right, the right, same right. time, Slipknot's trajectory maybe even surpasses Korn by the second record, and we'll discuss it um, next week. But next week. So Slipknot puts this record out. And it was jarring to first hear. So, like, you know, what records came out in 1999 in metal, right? SM Metallica and Ugh. Godsmack and a lot of this mm. post grunge stained, uh, which is sort of rock. new metal yeah, and post grunge. Rock. A lot of butt rock is happening at this time. Nickelback is happening right after this period of time. A lot of pop punk. Warp Tour is at its arguably hugest level ever in the early, late 90s to early aughts, right? So you don't yet have, you have Ozfest, but you don't yet have Mayhem, you know, Mayhem Fest yet. You don't have some of these things. But It's so, a weird time. It is a, it's a weird time and we can, that would be a whole great chaser. But so Slumnot drops this record and it just starts to buzz, dude. That video, they start getting on every tour. They start like System of a Down would come along another year later or about the same time. And they start playing or about the same time. They start playing opening for everybody. There are many tours that are like Slipknot, System of a Down, Seven Dust, a lot of S's here, a lot of alliteration, Spine Shank, <laughs> Stained. All opening for Limp Biscuit, if you will, or Clutch. It's the Cobra Commanders tour. Kind of. So uh, it's Serpentor, Cobra Commander, Destro, Major Blood. Anyway, so. Tomax and Zaymont. Tomax and Zaymont, the Dreadnoughts. Um, so, yeah, man, this you can't really fathom how this record rode a wave, right? So, like, Typo Negative took like five years to get to Bloody Kisses or four years. And then Bloody Kisses was the biggest selling album on the label of Roadrunner, the whole rest of the 90s. They had some big ones. Big and there's other, hit. there's some other records I'm gonna say, like I think Slipknot subconsciously borrowed from Sepultura, borrowed from the second Machine Head record, which is tuned very way down and very weird, experimental, scronky riffs, right? There's it, so it, much stuff going on with the Slipknot sound. What's your, what was your impression of hearing this back after a long time, maybe okay. for the first time ever with New Year's? This is actually the first time ever I've listened to the record. And I, I, I saw, as I said, I saw them, no interest. And because 
I, I was not in a place to appreciate what they were doing. I was far too pretentious for my own good. However, listening to this, like I said earlier, the big thing was that Bronx and Tambor Sepultura record. Hearing the extra percussion and how it improved Chaos, or uh, not Chaos, what's the name of the song? Uh, Chaos ID, Chaos ID, Tanks on the Street, Territory. That is probably my absolute favorite Sepultura song. Nothing will ever top that. And hearing the other 48 dudes, you know, beating on these, da -da 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 -da, uh, on those, those, those roto whatever toms those, or drums or garbage cans, it increased the quality of that music, which, le which led me to open the door to what Slipknot was doing. Because I remember seeing the Jamaican drums and the dudes in masks and all, you know, the turntable, you know, the, the DJ, I still don't quite get the DJ bit, but this album is abject. It is the, it is the complete summation of the post-grunge metal chaos. And it, you know, metal now, after the democratization of music, after where you don't need Roadrunner Records or Metal Blade Records to put out your album and get worldwide distribution. I could put out a heavy metal death metal record today and have it around the world on Thursday. You didn't have that back then. So the world of metal in a post-Kurt Cobain world was strange and misguided. What Slipknot does is they take all of those things all of the misguided ideas, the tuning down, the grooves, the crab core, throw in a DJ, what the fuck? Let's go ahead and rap like, uh, God, who are those numb nuts? Uh, 311, let's rap like 311 does sometimes. What the fuck, who cares? Let's do everything that we have been listening to for the past 10 years and not try to be Slayer not try to be Sepultura, though there is a clear influence in Sepultura. The riffage, the chord progressions, there's a lot here. When you say it's unchecked, I believe it's a purpose, I believe it's purposefully unchecked. You you can't be so similar to someone without discussing, without no, I mean someone like Sepultura. Sepultura is not Metallica, they're not Megadeth, they're not Anthrax. These are guys that are a little smaller. Anyway, that's the point. But uh, here's a fun thing. If you love old school heavy metal in 1999, Slayer, Metallica, Iron Maiden, Judas Priest, Black Sabbath, or you like doom metal, or you are a, a black biker vest wearing death metal fan, death, obituary, suffocation, morbid angel, morbid angel at the gates, you hate Slipknot. You see oh, Slipknot, yeah. and you're like, fuck these guys. That's, these guys, yeah, that's exactly like, where without hearing them, without even giving them a chance, you're like, fucking wrote them right off, right? So, totally like, right. it's also, so on one hand, this whole new generation of fans suddenly has, like, a new messiah, and a whole group of old school metal fans are like, fuck this. Yeah. And immediately, like, literally, there's rapping. The very first lyrics of the Slipknot record are a rap that rivals any rap of the 90s, almost. Like, there's some wild shit on this first track, right? We're going to do the track by track in a second. We're going to really whiz through the track by track and wrap up the show probably like within 10 or 15 minutes. But like, it's that quick to like the, the arc of the story is so interesting. I wanted to spend the most time on it and we're fair. not going to do the set list until the next show when I yeah. talk about Ozfest and things like that. But um, yeah, man, Slipknot played Ozfest on the side stage and no one knew who they were. They were the first band on in yep. those jumpsuits in a hundred whatever degree heat with the masks. And like, we're not even going to talk about the live shit. That's next week. Just the record. This shit was wild when I first heard it. And I wasn't too impressed. It's wild today. All, it's wild today. All my friends immediately were like on it. I was in a heavy metal thrash band, right? With a few other, a little bit. Of, we used to fool around with some new metal influences. We would cover like Rage Against the Machine. We would cover Corn. We would cover Deftones. But really, we were a thrash metal and heavy metal band, like a Queensryche, Metallica, Pantera. That's the that's really where we lived. With an occasional, we started throwing in like a corn riff here or there because we thought it was cool and we grooved well. We grooved better than we were anything else. So I heard this thing and I was like, not for me. And all my friends were so hype on it. I was like, nah, a couple of my best, closest metal go show going buddies. We were like, nah, this isn't for me. I already love Deftones and Corn. 
and I and some other bands. But I was like, nah, this is I don't know why I don't see it. I I get the gimmick. I get the I, I yeah, like the visual. I, I, I don't get the I, music. I couldn't I couldn't get it then. I can get it now. I couldn't get it then. So we're gonna quickly do the track by track. I'm gonna lead us through. We're gonna go pretty quick here. Yeah, and you can. I'll, chime, I'll chime in when you're done. You chime you in. With, well, I mean, like you know, I can go through some of the tracks, and if you want to stop me and add a point, you can. If you don't, that's fine. Um, the record is wickedly front loaded in terms of like enormous songs. Completely. It. It. Yeah. Yeah, uh, it's wickedly front loaded, but there's still some great like they play most of this live to this. That's day. how you break bands is you you put all your best songs on side one. Yeah, that's fair. So um, forgive me. I'm looking off screen. There it is. I have my shit set up now. Here we go. The record begins with basically a sample. Like a, Nick's least favorite thing ever, a warm up track. Yeah, but, but that, I liked I liked this one. Yeah, yeah. The whole thing, I think, is sick, looped and repeated over and over because the first track is sick. Uh, mm -hmm. oh, and yeah. that that warm up track you hear it to this day at a lot of their shows and it just you get so hyped for it i i can't explain it but it is it's it's a like hype um god fuck uh god hates us all yep uh yeah i we're gonna talk about slayer and other bands copying slipknot next week we'll get anyway, we'll get we'll we're get. gonna get there it's gonna piss people off let me tell you so sick is the first proper track on the record so first full song it's three minutes and 19 seconds it is a complete ass whipper and it starts it takes that that it starts with this in, incredible cacophony of drumming not just joey jordison's incredible double bass blast beat everything. drumming but not only do you have the other percussionist doubling Joey, the both the DJ guy and the mixer, we'll call him, the keyboardist mixer soundscape guy, they also interloop in drum stuff. So some you hear stuff sometimes and it's like, what am I hearing? I'm hearing these yeah, and riffs and these heavy groove riffs. And then I'm hearing like also break beats and dancey beats in the background not like EDM, like not like that, like like all like extra like accents and other things, other layers and layers of drums, plus the real drums, plus the percussion. It's, it's wild. It's like an army song, of elephants coming at you. Yes, it's abject, heavy, grooving chaos with a purpose. And that is the best thing I could say. It's about not it. I'm listen, listening to this song going, huh. Have I been wrong for 25 years? So this record is alternately, it's tuned pretty far down. It's down between C and A. And it's tuned down. Yeah, mostly A, occasionally C. C was the, A is the corn and, and Fear Factory 90s classic tuning, right? A standard. Yeah, oh and then yeah. C is the standard tuning of Sepultura for most of their career Ever. until they went to A for Roots. Right. And so Sick, it's short, it's to the point, it's got a, uh, it, it's just nuts and they still this is one of their biggest songs still to this day and the riffs are heavy like if you love if you objectively just listen to it for the riffs they are on par with some of the best death metal of the time disagree but that's fine okay the next track is eyeless and this is still to this day my favorite slipknot song but it didn't become so until much later uh i this song has an unbelievable groove. Probably one of the best two, the, the verse, the main verse and the the ending groove. There's like a sort of a, a coda groove to the like last half of the song that is unreal. Just so a couple of things real yeah. quick. Um, I had an ear infection this week, so I did not have uh, uh, the ability to put earphones in. So I apologize, but also I'm going to let Keefe, I'm really going to give my thoughts on this album at the end. So sure. what right. I really, I, I really want Keefe to just blow through this. I'm and blowing through. Give me, and they give me two minutes to, to give me my That's summary. fine. That's fine. Eyeless is amazing and has the incredible lyric, you can't see California without Marlon Brando's eyes. I'm still trying to figure out what the fuck that means. Wow. 20 something years later. But yeah, uh, um, incredible lyrics. Incre Corey's scream is already fully formed. Uh, it's heavier than corn. He also can rap as good as Zach De La Roca or anybody. He also can sing, uh, which you'll find out on the next track. It's probably still one of their biggest tracks ever. Wait and Bleed was a huge hit single, was huge on MTV on the second era of Headbangers Ball with Jamie Josta. Uh, it was an actual, just an MTV hit 
a TRL song even, and, and has the amazing chorus that opens the song. And literally you hear him scream, you hear him rap, you hear him sing. It's unbelievable. It's like Fear Factory levels, early Burton C. Bell levels of ability to switch on and off your voice and uh, Wait and Bleed Kills. Surfacing used to be the closer or opener for every Slipknot song. Occasionally they still close with it. Uh, on the famous Slipknot live album, he refer he always says, this is your new national anthem. Uh, you know, fuck, fuck this world. Fuck everything that you stand for. Fuck it all. Don't give a shit. Don't ever judge I, me. I just want bands to stop saying that. I understand, but they were like, this was like their anti-authoritarian, anti-everything I get it, I lyrics. get it, I get it. I, I just think we can come up with a better a better system like why, right. why can't why can't we say this is your new god bless america yeah something like that whatever i like national anthem i don't like god bless america i'm being you know it's a better song than our national anthem i don't i wouldn't want our anthem to be god bless america but it is a great song i'll give it to irving berlin um spit it out is the next one another huge hit and that's the one with the shining inspired video mm. and uh, uh, the ending of this song is just it almost sounds like a mamba a mambo like a mambo song, literally like a dance, like a cha-cha-cha. Well, this isn't far out from mambo number five, so. It's far enough away from Monica, uh, mambo number five, but a little bit of Monica is what I need in my life. Anyway, oh, so that's the first half of the record is just banger after banger. First no, half of the record is a big thunderstruck. It, it, yeah, it's, it's huge. And then I'm going to say diehard fans love this whole thing. I'm going to say like the original album really is like 12, 13 songs with a secret track. And I'm going to say of the second half of the album, Tattered, Tattered and Torn, Purity, Liberate Us, a minor hit, Liberate My Madness, which is an incredible sing-along chorus, Prosthetics I Always Liked, No Life and Diluted are decent tracks. And then there's kind of a the Digipack, because you know Roadrunner's got to put out the Digipack a year later to sell more records. So they had an additional bonus import tracks. Me Inside is a track they have just been playing again for the first time in a long time live. And Get This is another sort of, Get This was like a demo track that they played live for a few years and was on an earlier record that was also on this album. There have been multiple re-releases of the track list with extra tracks. Scissors is the official last track with the secret track Eeyore. Um, but yeah, the majority of this record, let's say the opening, you know, the intro, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, all bangers, no filler, very little filler. And then there's a few other tracks that are squiffy ish, but the I'm going to disagree a little bit, but not much. The thing about this album is this album reminds me in. I, and I don't mean this as a comparative, but it reminds me a lot of the construction of Dark Side of the Moon. Dark Side of the Moon is one song cut up into many little parts. The problem with this album is there's a lot of riffing. There's a lot of songs where it stays really the same for way too long for my tastes, for my tastes. However, that was the style at the time, I believe they were also wearing turnips on their belts, which was also the style at the time. So we're talking about artistic choices that sometimes last, sometimes don't. However, this album is chaotic. This is the Tasmanian devil after being kicked in the nuts. That is the only way I can think of how, how the, every kind of metal from up to 1999 that you've ever heard is here. Sometimes it's not fully formed. Sometimes it is just, you know, what they got drunk and spat out or tripped some acid and played some doors. And that's what makes this a very rough listen. It's produced very well. Excuse me, the burpee. God damn it anyway. Next week, I'm burping more. Part. And burping more because you said that. I'm going. I'm going to go to my grave sink saying that. Anyway, so it is. It is abject chaos, and what with a purpose, and that's what makes it great. And I really thought. I swear to God, I really thought I was going to be moping through this series. And frankly, I put the 2022 pressing of this record on my wish list today. Probably 
maybe be 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 checking it before the series is over. I think the thing that helps Slipknot is these two things. They have this chaos magic of riffs and just oppressive beats mm -hmm. and just just constant overstimulation, very much like our culture, very much the Red Bull or Napster. You know, it's too many choices. It's too many channels, right? <laughs> too many choices it is definitely short attention span when they learn to limit the choices and narrow that field they really be they really become the band they are now but this record's incredible and i'm gonna say the really the thing is i don't think they would have been as big with the former singer and i know that people love that guy no that's nobody, they invited him to stay they invited him back multiple times to come in at different points and Corey is one of the just even if you hate the guy because he's a knucklehead in social media and pop culture, he is an incredible talent. And his ear for melody and his ability to sing hooks on Wait and Bleed and spit it out. And you know, even if he's screaming and surfacing, Liberate is so catchy and so heavy that he sells the song to you. Really Correct. Well. Correct. He is probably the MVP of this record for me because he does so many different things most of the dudes all 1763 of them are most of them are doing one or two things whereas Corey is doing 17 things it's true and i think again like it, i don't want to cast aspersions if there are limitations on the record is it's not written by a whole band it's written by a short number of those people and so you're getting kind of it's distilled through them it's clown's vision distilled through these master musicians with Corey on top. Uh, Jim Root, like I said, comes in late and records some guitar solos, does not have an impact on the writing until later in the next nobody's record. Nobody's record is the band. I mean, that's... no. Nobody's first so. record is the band. The first record is the songs that... Because every band goes through periods of flux. And mm -hmm. your first record is always what just ended up being, typically, just what ended up being based on the dudes that were in the band at the time, that moment, that week, that, that month, that year. Yeah. And then you get signed and half of those dudes are gone. So I hear you. I, wouldn't is, I mean, they are like, in a way they got, especially in a band with 17 dudes. Slipknot didn't lose a guy until Paul passed away. So they had this lineup. Impressive. They had the, the lineup that is finalized. And I think Chris, the Dick Nose guy who was kicked out a couple of years ago, um, which we'll talk about later. The Dick Nose guy came in also late into the making of Slipknot. So he's just kind of doubling a clown and not really mm -hmm. creating his own stuff. Um, but really and truly the band that is finalized at the completion of this record upon release, once they go on tour, when they got Chris in the band, mm -hmm. uh, Craig also had been a guitar player. I, I didn't mention that in other bands like Craig and Sid had been other, not just doing what they're doing. Oh, first, yeah. Like we'll talk about the show stuff next year, but like when they finalized and crystallized this band, that lineup is in for 11 straight years and three more albums uninterrupted, even with the turmoil and other things. So you have to really appreciate what they did to put this thing out, put it together, storm the metal world. This is still the biggest selling record. Uh, I believe it's the biggest selling record in Roadrunner history, except for that one Nickelback record with How You Remind Me. To, you know, like, and, and even then, I think this is how we're sold Nickelback because Nickelback's been kind of like, um, you know, until their new record comes out soon, they've been hiding for a while. So, like, I know I don't want to talk much about them. I'd love to interview Nickelback. I'm just going to put it out there. My dream is to interview Chad. My dream. My hey, dream. Every six or seven songs Nickelback writes, one of them is good. Yeah. So, anyway, that's the first Slipknot record. We're going to stop here. Stop I'm not going to talk about the tour. We're going to start next week with the tour. Ozfest, second record high huge success and the result of those things and so and it'll be a much shorter listen i know it was a lot of lead time here a lot of exposition heavy exposition at the beginning but i really i researched hard to understand i went through reddits i didn't trust wikipedia i went through reddits i have Corey's first book that is not quite a memoir but a little bit of his but he was also even really only in this not a year and a half when they made this record he was late to the party um a couple of years he was in the band total so anyway that's my story on slipknot i don't really have anything else to add but i appreciate I everybody nothing, for listening i got nothing else to add if you've made it this far you are awesome please like subscribe uh this record frankly is great i wanted i expected to hate it i was wrong i will say that today which is a rare thing and now because i did it last week i'm gonna let keep you take us home
Oh, shit, son. All right, then. Well, you have been listening to the Glacially Musical Podcast. Uh, thank you for being with us. If you've listened this far, we really appreciate you. Please rate this on wherever you listen to podcasts. Apple, it's a five-star rating. would be helpful if you liked it. Uh, you know, Spotify with a follow. Other podcast services with a follow and a like. We really appreciate it. Get notified whenever we drop a new episode, usually once a week, sometimes two, once in a blue moon. We might have a special one coming soon. We don't know. We're waiting. God damn it, Metallica Vinyl Club. Send Fingers the record. crossed, motherfuckers. Send the record, Metallica Vinyl Club. Send the record. Anyway, but thanks for listening. We really, really appreciate it. I am just honored and proud to still be here co-hosting this podcast with Nick. Thank you so much for having me, Nick. And uh, yeah, check out Slipknot at the links in the description. And as we always say, this has been the Glacially Musical Podcast. It does not play in Peoria, but Slipknot has played in Peoria quite a few times. I gotta pee.